I titled today's message, Four Responses. Four Responses, or Four Attitudes, if you will. These are the four attitudes when it comes to hearing God's Word. The book of Matthew, Matthew, the Gospel writer, presents Jesus as the King. And we see this evident in chapter 1, where the genealogy is given the messianic line, proving that Jesus is indeed from the line of King David. So he is proven to be king in chapter 1 of Matthew. Chapter 2, we have the magi, the wise men from the east. They come and present themselves to the baby Jesus, proving to us, all of us, that indeed Jesus is not just a baby, but is king. Chapter 3, we have the testimony of John, who really testifies that Jesus Christ is indeed the king. Chapter 4, Jesus defeats Satan's temptation, thereby proving once again, affirming to all of us that he is king. He is able to rule over all things, including Satan. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of the king. No teaching could come from any other than the King Almighty. Chapters 8, 9, and 10, we see the power of Jesus, the miracles, supernaturalism of Jesus that proves that he is king. Chapter 11 and 12, we see the pronouncement of judgment upon the Pharisees. And even upon judging the Pharisees, Jesus invites them to come to him for salvation at the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12, they actually cross the line too far. And so Jesus condemns them for the final time. Your sins cannot be forgiven. You have now crossed over to the area where you are now unforgiven. Your sins cannot be pardoned. So now in chapter 13, Matthew begins to turn a new leaf. This is a new thing. And chapter 13 tells us about the kingdom. And the kingdom of God is twofold, actually. The Israelites were waiting for the Messiah for centuries. When the Messiah did come, they rejected him, crucified him. So when Jesus went back to be with the Father in heaven, the kingdom of God was left for the church. We, we call this age the church age or the mystery, the age of mystery. This is what's called an interim period. This is what is called a parenthesis period. I want you to know that the Jews will be received by God in the end. They are the chosen people of God. Right now, they have rejected Christ, but God being faithful to his word, he is going to redeem them. And I want us to look at Zechariah chapter 12, if we could, on the screen. Zechariah chapter 12 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom... They have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourning for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So we see that in the end times that the Jews will indeed embrace the Son of God. And we see also in the book of Revelation, we see that in chapter 9, I believe in verse 7, if we can have that on screen. Revelation, if not, I'll have to look at my notes. After this, <laughs> and I behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So we see that at the end times, end times, in the end, the Jews and the people of all tribes, language, and culture will come and embrace the Messiah. And every Gentile, every Jew, all of these people will come together because God is faithful. In the economy of God, when we are considering the kingdom of God, there are two aspects. Number one, we see that the kingdom of God is where God is, wherever God is, that's the kingdom of God. He rules everything. He is the ruler of everyone and everything. 
we see the kingdom of God being ruled by God himself. Let us look at Ephesians, that is 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. We see clearly from Scripture that God is above all things. He is the creator of all things. He is in control and is ruling every one and everything. But if you go back to Genesis, for instance, not only is God, Jesus, ruler of all things, of his kingdom, indirectly he rules as well. As we see in the Garden of Eden, he allowed Adam and Eve to rule on his behalf, but of course they failed, and Satan becomes the prince of the air. He rules the earth, and for now, Satan is ruling and roaming about the earth as he pleases, because God, who is in control even over Satan, has allowed him to do so. And so he uses people like Abraham's and Isaac's and Jacob's. He uses all the judges and prophets. When we come to the New Testament, Jesus himself comes and rules. And after he dies and ascends and is seating at the right hand of God the Father, he now allows the apostles and now Christians, the church, all of us. So the kingdom is twofold, as I said. The kingdom of God is everything. God is the ki king, the ruler of the whole thing, the entire universe. But while he is absent, again, we call this period the parenthesis period or the mystery period, the church age period, the king is not present. Just like in the Old Testament when, when King David was king, and yet when he was being pursued by Absalom, he hid in caves. He was hiding, and everyone was after him. The king was not there, but that did not take away his kingship. He was king nevertheless. Jesus, for the time being, right now, is not here in body. Even though he is in our hearts, so in that sense, yes, he rules us. He rules everything. But there will come a time when he will physically return because he has to return in order to redeem his people. And in the book of Revelation, we are told that 144,000 Jews will be anointed to preach and proclaim the word of God to the ends of the earth. So once the message of Jesus Christ is proclaimed to the ends of the earth, Jesus will return. He will reign on earth for a period of about 1,000 years. Scholars argue whether that's a literal 1,000 years or a figurative 1,000 years. Whatever the case, since the Bible does say that a 1,000 years to the Lord is like a day to him, a day to him is like a 1,000 years. Whether it's a literal 1,000 years or not, there will be some form of a, a years of a period of ruling king, there will be new heaven and new earth, and finally we will be entering eternity with God. Of course, just before that would be judgment, and hell, Satan, and all of his angels will be put, and all the unbelievers will be put in hell. The believers will be spending eternity with Christ. Right now, however, is this interim period, the church age, and how long this age will last, nobody knows. And Jesus himself says, I do not know myself. Not that he didn't know, it's that he let go of his prerogatives. He let go of his glorious Godhead. That is, he never ceased to be God, but he let go of all of his privileges. He could be at all places, but he chose to be a man who was limited to being one place at one time. But when he, that is when we join him in heaven, he is going to be the glorious king, the God we, on Friday, we talked about what's going to be happening in heaven, how there's going to be no tearing, no sadness, that we're going to have glorious bodies. And one asked, would we be able to fly in heaven? I said, well, I, I suppose we could. Jesus, when he was resurrected, he went through a wall where his disciples were gathering, all scared because they had just seen their master be crucified, they felt that the Romans were going to come and get them. So they were all in fear when Jesus would all of a sudden appear in a room. Many times he would do that. And we joked around saying, yeah, but when we get to heaven, should we, 
are we supposed to wear our masks even there? And we said, no, of course not. There's no COVID. But then some also joked, yeah, but there's always going to be somebody who's going to be trying to sell something. Of course, this is all a joke. But when we get to heaven, it'll be a glorious thing. Right now is a temporary interim period of church age. Once this age comes to a close, Jesus is going to return, set up his kingdom on earth for a period of time, and then there will be judgment, and then we'll be in heaven with God, and with all the saints of old, we'll be spending forever with our eternal Heavenly Father, and that will be a glorious, glorious day. Jesus speaks of parables, first of something that is very usual, things that people know, and then he turns to things that people do not understand. He starts with simple to complex. He starts with things that are normal, average, and then he turns to supernatural where nobody understands. And that's exactly what happens here. This is first of eight parables told in this segment. And parable is a story, an illustration talking about the kingdom. So if we can look at uh, verses 1, 2, and 3, please, of this chapter, chapter 13. If you can put on screen verses 1, 2, and 3, chapter 13 of Matthew. That same day, that same day referring to that day earlier in chapter 12, Jesus healed a demon-possessed man. He criticized and condemned the Pharisees. He did all kinds of miracles. It was a busy, busy day. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Biblical illustration, metaphor for house is Jews. Seas represent Gentiles. So now at the beginning stages of Jesus' ministry, he stayed in the house a lot. He emphasized the Jews, but then towards the end of ministry, he emphasized the Gentiles. So we can recognize that he is now coming to his near death on the cruise. Calvary, that is crucifixion, he's going to the cross soon. So he's now spending time in the streets and in the fields, in mountains and, and hillsides and so on. And so now he is by the sea. And when great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. It's interesting when Jesus preached, he often would sit down and the people would stand. Today we have it the other way. Everybody sits and the preacher stands of course, when we praise God, all of us stand, including the preacher. So I don't really get to sit down. But when Jesus sat down, the whole crowd stood on the beach. Let's look at verse 3. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And then from verse 4, he begins to tell about the four attitudes, and the very first one has to do with, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Just leave that on the screen for a while. Historians tell us that there were gaps between fields that these farmers would have, and it's about three feet, and people and animals will, will pass by, and the path or that way, that road would be very hard. It was almost like a concrete because over time, Palestine having not much rain and it just became very, very hard. And when the seeds were planted by these farmers who would have a pouch, a leather pouch, they would grab seeds, exact amount because they're so used to it, they would grab a certain amount of seeds and they would take exact steps towards the end, and they would scatter the seed, and some would fall onto these three-foot area that would be very concrete-like, very hard. It was not watered. It was very difficult for anything to grow, and some seeds would indeed fall along that area, and the farmer would go to the end, and he would turn around and come back and scatter seed until his whole field is scattered with seeds. And so these farmers knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. What they didn't realize is what is going to come. So Jesus, again, may I remind you that he starts with some common things that everybody knew. These were farmers. These were agricultural society. They knew about seeds and farming, and they knew all that. 
So when Jesus is talking about the seeds, they knew exactly what he was talking about. But the birds would come, and these birds, by the way, were not welcome at all by the farmers. And when the farmers would turn their back, these birds would come and eat these seeds. And the other gospel, Luke tells us that these seeds that were not eaten by the birds would be stomped by people walking along that path. So that, that is the first attitude or first heart or first response. It is that first seed or soil. It's all the same thing. Seed is the message of God. Sower is the one who preaches the word of God. And the, that land is the field or our hearts. The second, second area where seeds are landing is in verse 5 and verse 6. First of all, verse 5, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. Verse 6, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. The farmers didn't have rocks or stones. They picked them all up. But what they did not know was that underneath were rocks that they did not themselves know. So when the seeds were planted in these rocky soil or ground, the roots were shallow because they couldn't go down any deeper. They, it would get stopped right there by the rocks. And so it seemed like these seeds were producing right away because they grew faster than others because they didn't have to go very far. Once they reached the rocky area, they would sprout up. And so these farmers would mistakenly believe, wow, what a harvest, what a great harvest this year is going to be. What they failed to realize is that they come up quickly, but when the sun came up, because the roots were shallow, they withered away and died. The third one comes from verse 6. Verse 6 and seven, let's look at verse seven. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell among thorns, or weeds. Weeds grow faster, much faster than, than other, other plants. And it's funny how they grow big. And if you pull the top without pulling the bottom, they will grow even taller. And if you have a garden at home, you know how this is, how you just on the surface get rid of the weeds, but not getting rid of the bottom, the root, they will continue, continue to come out. Other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew and choked them. And so these third type, third seeds were all choked up. They really did not produce. And in verse eight, other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundred, some 60, some thirsty. These were seeds that were planted in good ground and they produce 160 some thirsty. The reason is that depending on the soil, depending on which land or field you would produce 100 some 60 some thirsty. On an average, if you produce 7.5 fold, it was a very very good production. It was a very, very good harvesting. And if you had anything like fivefold, it was average. But Jesus gives us this example of 160 and 30, meaning that we can do incredible things once we are landed, that is our hearts being ready, and we will be producing incredible amount. We will be bringing in extraordinary things. When they heard this, they knew the basics, but they did not understand the spiritual meaning. So Jesus explains himself, starting with verse 19, chapter 13 of Matthew. He says, let's go to verse 19, not 9, 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. By the way, that verse 9, those who have ears let him hear. Jesus is saying, do you not understand what I'm saying? Do you have any idea what I'm telling you? Of course, they didn't. 
So verse 19, he explains, Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This has to do with the first ground, that weed, not the weed, the hard place, that concrete-like place, that place where animals have walked and people have stomped all over. It is talking about a heart that is cold, the heart that is really defiant, a heart that is wicked, they will not receive the word of God. This has to do with the evil that's so, so rampant in one's heart that over years, over time after time after time, the evil sins have calloused the heart. It's that seed, that, that hard, stony heart which is the second one, if you can take a look at verses 20 and 21. Verses 20 and 21, as for what's sown on rocky ground, this is one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Verse 21, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, the word immediately he falls away. Some people come to church listening to the word of God. Some people listen to the Word of God through YouTube, and they are joyful. They have exuberance. Exuberance is a mark of a Christian who is saved. But just because you are joyful does not necessarily mean that you are a saved person. So people would hear the Word of God. They're excited. Oh, yes, especially if you're coming out of a tragedy. If you're coming out of a problem, a rut. If you're coming out of a, some kind of a dilemma. And you hear the good news of Jesus Christ, one becomes very joyful. But that joyfulness does not mean that you're saved. You are like the seed that was planted and scattered and it, it just fell right into the rocky soil. Your heart is a shallow heart. You're very shallow. You never, never go deep enough into the bottom of the soil. And so... Jesus is saying, if you are one of those people, he's talking to us, the church age today. This is a relevant message to us. This parable is talking about the kingdom age. For those of you in the second category, your heart, your attitude, your response, is it the one that you are responding like initially with joy and excitement, and then you fall away? The third type we see is in verse 22 of Matthew 13. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. This kind of faith, people who are initially excited about the gospel... They go about the business of the world, whether it be children, if you happen to be married, whether it be your girlfriend or boyfriend, if you happen to be unmarried and you happen to have that loved one next to you. It could be your job. It could be your studies. It could be anything that you find yourself focusing and concentrating on rather than responding to the word of God. Initially, again, you are joyful, enthusiastic, excited, exuberant, but then you fall away because you are so busy with the things of the world. And this symbolizes how we are today, exactly how we are today. You either listen to the word and either is cold-hearted, stony-hearted, or you are shallow, or you just are like, so into the world that the word of God is not all that significant. And then finally in verse 23, we hear the explanation of the one who has sown on good soil. This is the one who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who applies it. This is the one who accepts the word, applies the word, hears the word, understands the word. Here you will be bearing 30, 60 100-fold, only the opposite, 160, 30-fold. 
Which heart, which response would you be giving today? Brothers and sisters in Christ, all of you are hearing the word of God today. How are you going to respond? Are you going to respond in such a way that you respond in joy, but then you would fall away? Would you wither away? Would birds come and eat? How would you respond? You hear the words of God. Are you going to apply the word? Are you going to trust the word? Are you going to receive the word? Or are you going to just let it all choke and die? Wither away and die. Many people hear the word of God. And that is why in the church, we have people coming initially very excited, but a few weeks down the road or a few months down the road, you never hear from them. Because they never, never consider the cost of following Jesus. Coming to Jesus initially sounds like, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, heavy burdened, I will give you rest. Oh, I do need some rest. I just broke up with my relationship. I, I, I am so broken up. I am hurting physically, emotionally, psychologically. Jesus has come. So here I am. Oh, this is great. They are looking for a group. They're looking for some identity. They're looking for some support group. So a church provides that. They come and they get free food. They come and have fellowship. They have activity. It's fun. But once Jesus requires, once they learn that Jesus requires one to really become a disciple, which costs something, sacrificing something, then they slowly wither away. I trust that none of you here this morning are in that camp, that you will stay till the end, that you would come listening to the word of God, and not just listening to the word of God, but reacting to it, affirming it, and living it, I pray that that is our heart and that is our response. Do not be like those other people. Let us be faithful to his word and react to his word, thereby giving him glory. This church age is a mystery because the Old Testament people never saw it coming. They thought that they were waiting for the Messiah. And once the Messiah came, that they thought that there would be the eternal blissful kingdom. They never saw this interim period called the church age. Jesus certainly knew it. He is going to come back and he is going to set up his glorious kingdom. May all of us be partakers of that. May we try to witness the word of God. Those who are presenting the gospel are the sower, the greatest sower, the greatest, of course, the main, the seed itself is Jesus Christ. The message, plant these seeds. But it is not the fault of the seed planter. Planters, if you are preaching the message, it is not the fault, the response, the result is always on the part of the soil that is the heart. It's up to you. So if you reject the word, it is the, the seed itself is not at fault. It is not the messenger at fault. It is your heart, your attitude, your response. May you respond favorably today so that you will receive indeed 160 and 30 fold May God richly, richly be glorified because you have put your trust and faith in him today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.